We're, we're trying to address the problem of antimicrobial resistance by discovering new antibiotics, one of the uh, topics we heard discussed just now. Um, so what you can see in this figure here is a timeline over the last 70 or so years of discovery of antibiotics. And what I've done here is highlight what we call the, um, uh, the golden era of natural product discovery. Most of the antibiotics that we use today have been isolated from soil bacteria. So in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, we were um, going to the soil, isolating bacteria and, and using the antibiotics that they produce. This is natural product screening. Towards the end of that period, around the 1970s, uh, we just kept discovering the same antibiotics again. And so people got a bit fed up of doing this and there were some new technologies arrived in the 1980s. And essentially around this time, Big Pharma turned away from natural product discovery and started using um, other methods. The other thing you can see from this figure here is at this end of the pipeline, the right-hand end of the pipeline, um, it's less well populated. There are less drugs there. And essentially, over the last 30 years, there have been no new classes of antibiotics introduced into medical practice. Most of the antibiotics we've been using in this period here are just chemical modifications, tweaks of current antibiotics, previous, previous molecules. Um, and some of the antibiotics we've been using in more recently are the sorts of things you heard about just now, colistin, which was originally shelved because it's too toxic. So these are not particularly good antibiotics. Because of this, because of the uh, lack of antibiotics at this end of the scale, you've maybe heard the term that the antibiotic pipeline is drying up, and we need to repopulate that, that pipeline. So that begs the question, where will these antibiotics come from? <clears throat> we can carry on chemically modifying, chemically tweaking the antibiotics that we've already have. Um, and this may lead to uh, new drugs that progress to the market quite rapidly, but that is a short-term fix. It's a quick fix that's likely to fail because resistance mechanisms, resistance will catch up. There are a number of groups, uh, mainly in universities uh, and small companies uh, that are engaged in drug discovery. And, and that's some of the work that I'll talk to you about now. Uh, because of the uh, AMR review, because of some of the initiatives coming out of that review, Big Pharma are starting to look at this area again, uh, which is a, a really great outcome of that review. Um, <clears throat> in the 80s and 90s, billions of dollars, huge amounts of money were wasted pretty much on design, random design and combinatorial chemistry to try and come up with new antibiotics. And that didn't lead to a single drug that went into the market. So that was pretty much a waste of time. But I'll talk to you in a moment about some uh, new approaches to drug design that we're we're using. Uh, and there's growing interest now in, in alternative therapies. As you can see, this is a figure from the, uh, the AMR review. Uh, a number of alternative therapies, but we're particularly interested in these peptides, antimicrobial peptides. Uh, I've got a number of features that, that mean they may be good drug candidates. So I'll talk to you a little bit about that now. Um, antimicrobial peptides, I'm guessing you haven't heard of them, but we are all full of antimicrobial peptides, all plants, animals essentially produce antimicrobial peptides as part of our immune response to infection. It's the first line of defense to infection. Bacteria produce uh, antimicrobial peptides, AMPs, and these are called bactericins. And it's the bactericins that I'm particularly interested in and I'll talk to you about now. These are highly potent. They're at least 10 times more active than conventional antibiotics that we use regularly. So that's a real benefit. They also have novel modes of action, novel ways of working. And this means that they shouldn't be compromised by the current resistance mechanisms that are circulating in infecting bacteria now. They also have multiple modes of action. So we suggest that this means when we introduce them into the clinic, they haven't been introduced yet. But when we do, resistance shouldn't occur. It certainly shouldn't occur as quickly as we do see it occurring to, to, to conventional antibiotics. So those are the antimicrobial peptides that I'm interested in. I'll now just take you through three separate areas of my research. Um, <clears throat> and first, to demonstrate the, 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 the reason we're interested in these organisms, in these um, antibiotics, I'll talk to you about some, some data from a, an, a, an infection trial that we ran with an agent called um, NI01. Uh, this was discovered in my group in 2009, um, and it's now progressing towards preclinical development. NIO1 has very good activity against MRSA and other hospital superbugs that you may have heard of. In the 80s and 90s, MRSA was a huge problem, very significant threat within hospital systems. That's largely been managed and addressed by improved hygiene um, and infection control, isolation of patients, those sorts of things. But resistance is, is growing again in MRSA, so we need more 
new drugs to treat MRSA. So we ran a, a, an infection trial of topical infection with MRSA. So this is surface infection. And a single dose of, of this NIO1 compound was as effective as six doses of the current standard of care. So that's completely unprecedented. This single dose efficacy is, has just not been seen in this infection model before. So we think that justifies further development of this uh, novel antimicrobial, and we're now looking for, uh, for funding for preclinical testing and phase one studies. <clears throat> so I hope that, that gives you a, a feel for how effective uh, some of these compounds might be for topical therapy. Certainly, um, NIO1 looks like it might be good for treating and preventing skin infections and wound infections. But there is a, a major need, the, the biggest need, the most pressing need is for uh, antibiotics that can be used systemically. So these need to be either injected or um, taken orally. And most of these natural antibiotics that we found, that we find, in, including NIL1 and, and other bactericins, uh, they're very, very good at doing what they're made to do, killing other bacteria in the environment. But they were never made to be injected into humans, so basically they're not very good drugs. So we need to work on them and make them better, better drugs. So we have a new project uh, just starting now and funded by Innovate UK. And what we're going to do is take the, exploit the potent activity of bactericins. We're going to work with them to try and improve their drug-like properties. Um, and this is going to need some new approaches to drug design. So this isn't going to be done randomly. We're working with IBM and their cognitive computing facilities and with a company uh, with a national physical laboratory who have got very uh, good biophysical modeling um, uh, expertise. So we can predict changes in these bactericin molecules that will improve their drug-like properties. We can make synthetic versions of those bactericins um, and they will be then evaluated here in Plymouth where we'll test their activity in the laboratory and in infection models and we'll look at their safety, their toxicity. That information will then feed back ground into the models in um, IBM and NPL and this will iteratively improve the models uh, through the cognitive learning process, and it will improve the, uh, the designed peptides, designed bactericins coming out of that process. As the project progresses, we will feed candidate antibiotics into um, Ingenza, which is a collaborator of ours. These are world-leading industrial biotechnology company up in Edinburgh. They will make manufacturing systems for these uh, new antibiotics um, and scale those up for eventual uh, further uh, future clinical evaluation. And this uh, collection of expertise that we have here is, is very unique within drug discovery programs. We don't know of any other programs like this um, looking at drug development. So we're very confident that over the next three years we can really make a, a good impact on um, drug discovery for the bacteria-based antibiotics. The last area that I'll tell you about is uh, some new work that we're just starting here, and this links us into the marine theme within Plymouth. <coughs> So the, the deep sea or the marine environment is known to be very uh, biodiverse and sponges in particular, we've got some sponges here, deep sea sponges, sponges are known to harbour very diverse microbes. And the deeper you go um, into the sea, the more novel the organisms become that you find. So we've suggested that the bacteria that are produced by these novel bacteria, will pro they'll produce novel bacteria, new bacteria that we can work with. And we've already got some evidence of this, so in some preliminary work with Kerry Howell in the Marine Institute here, we've isolated um, bacteria from sponges recovered from the North Atlantic rock or trough. Um, and we've found that they're very novel organisms, and in lab-based assays, they kill MRSA and they kill other pathogenic bacteria. So we're aiming to uh, take these antimicrobials further through development over the next, um, next few years, again with the industrial biotechnology expertise of, of Ingenza. Uh, we have a PhD student starting in October who's going to work with these and, and with other molecules. Um, <clears throat> I was talking at the, uh, the World Sponge Congress earlier this week. There is, a, there is an event called the World Sponge Congress. Um, it's, it's all about deep sea sponges. Um, and, and, but I was talking with, with some of the, the, kind of the leaders in the field and they, they feel that there is genuine promise in this sort of approach. Um, there's only a couple of groups in the world that are looking at bactericins in deep sea sponges. Uh, but we've got some really quite distinctive skills here in Plymouth that we're able to use and, and, and we're confident we'll be successful in finding some very novel antimicrobials through this process. 
So I hope that I've demonstrated to you that there's a fairly strong case for developing bactericins as, uh, as, as therapeutics. Um, <clears throat> they are very potent natural products and we're mining them from, from a range of environments, including uh, very diverse and unique um, deep sea sponge communities. And we're working towards uh, rationally designing and testing completely new molecules that will um, hope to form a pipeline of novel, novel bactericin-based antibiotics that we can uh, develop over the coming years. <clears throat>